Hey, you. Yes, you. Listen to the Aggressive Life podcast right now. We need your help to take this show to the next level. One of the ways that you can do that is by leaving a rating and review whenever you listen to podcasts, whether it's Apple, Spotify, or YouTube, your ratings and reviews go a long way in putting the show in front of new people. So to say thanks, we have something just for you. That would be to say thanks for you actually leaving a review. You can do that and then shoot an email to Dirt with your mailing address and we'll send you a postcard and Aggressive Life sticker. It's all honor system, so leave those reviews, shoot that email, and you'll get something sweet in your mailbox. Let us know at Dirt at BrianTub.com. That's your real That's email. my new email address. <laughs> oh, my gosh. <laughs> that is awesome. Dirt at BrianTome.com. Let's get on with the show. Welcome to the Aggressive Life. Today, we're going to talk about the greatest team of all time, which, of course, if you thought we were talking about sports, would obviously be the Steelers from the 70s. Obviously. That's not them. It's not the 95 Bulls or the the Bears in 85. It's not the, it's maybe the Penguins in the 90s, the Pittsburgh Penguins, NHL fan. But no, it's none of those folks. The greatest, the greatest team that anybody will ever be a part of is marriage. It's the greatest team. And statistics show more and more Americans are either opting out of it or avoiding it altogether, or they're putting it off as long as possible. 1980, about 33% of all Americans were married by age 21. In 2021, that number fell to 6%. In 1980, two-thirds of Americans were married by age 25. Now it's closer to 22%. 40 years ago, the average American male married at 25, the average woman at 22. Today, the average first-time groom is 30 and the bride is 28. Do those numbers even matter? I, I, I probably am giving these to you and some of you are going like, yeah, that, that seems about right. That's fine. But... But maybe it's not fine. Maybe it says something about us that isn't all that complimentary. Maybe it has to do with why our happiness scores keep tanking. For the first time, the United States is out of the top 20 in the World Happiness Report, which I always wonders, do. who are these people who put out the World Happiness Report? Like, yeah. what? Uh, are, that's just your job. You're Studying the world happiness. Ha- study yeah. happy. I don't yeah. know. I just uh, tell us who's happy and who's sad. I know yeah. it's a fascinating report. I'm glad someone's doing it. Right. It's hard to imagine someone being happy doing the report. doing the happiness report. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> <laughs> but this is the first time since 2012 that this has happened. It's gone down. I've got somebody today who may be part of the answer to the problem. His name is. Brad Wilcox, that is Dr. Brad Wilcox. He's been working for decades to find answers to these questions. And he's got some pretty compelling arguments. He's a professor of sociology at the University of Virginia. Dr. Wilcox also serves as the director of the National Marriage Project, a nonpartisan initiative to provide research and analysis on the health of marriage in America and work to make it stronger. He's compiled a bunch of research into books like Get Married, Why Americans Must Defy the Elites, Forge Strong Families, and Save Civilization. His research has been featured on the New York Times, Wall Street Journal, NPR, Today Show, yada, 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 yada. And today, he's on the most power-packed media platform of all, The Aggressive Life. Welcome to The Aggressive Life, Dr. Brad Wilcox. Brian, great to be here today. <laughs> Good to, good to have you here today. I'm actually fascinated, first of all, that so many media outlets want to talk to you about this. Like you talked about, when you talk about NPR, you talk about the New York Times. In my mind, these aren't the kind of people that are, you know, rah-rah marriage, want mar- people to get married young, and yet they're having you on. Why do you think that is? Well, I do think we have, um, you know, seen it, particularly actually in the last year or two, Brian. Um, and I've I've been pleased in the last two months, basically, to be on 
you know, both the, the New York Times and the Wall Street Journal a couple of times on this whole subject, but also Fox News and, you know, PBS NewsHour. So I think there's kind of a recognition across the spectrum that things are, you know, going more, um, are, are going worse on, like on the happiness front, like you were mentioning. We're, we are seeing happiness come down in America. We're seeing deaths of despair go up. We're seeing the American dream kind of, in some important respects, flatline. And so I think some thoughtful voices on the left are looking around and they recognize there's a, there's a case to be made that what's happening in our families and to marriage in particular is part and parcel of why, you know, so many Americans are, having uh, difficulty with their lives and are succumbing to things like drug overdoses, um, loneliness, sadness, et cetera. So I think there's just in some precincts of the uh, elite media culture, um, a willingness to explore some new, uh, new angles and all this. So what do you, what do you think it is, Brad? Just go back to, you know, well, I'll, I'll give my own self because so many of us are, we're a product of our own, generation our own story in 1988 like all my friends were getting married and it got to the point where I thought oh my gosh all my friends are getting married that means the pro the next person I date seriously I just got to get married like time is time is time is ticking here chop chop sure of course I was 22 <laughs> 22 <laughs> which is which is old for anthropological history, right? I mean, we've we found and committed to somebody for most of anthropological history as soon as we could ejaculate. That's been the, that's kind of one of the fascinating things from my research is just the whole idea of adolescence. It didn't pop up until about 1900. You know, this idea that you would, you would have, you know, five years where you were expected to be a non-contributing citizen. Now it's probably from 15 to age 30. You're, you're expected to be a non-contributing adolescent who can't control your urges. And, and, and all corners of the globe, through all anthropological history, as soon as you could ejaculate, it showed, oh, you can handle a family now and you can fight in war. So you're a man now. Um, that, we're, we're, we're long, long ways from that. But what is what do you think has changed? Why is it changing? What uh, I, I was twenty two. That's where my peer group was back in sure. nineteen eighty eight. That's certainly not now. Why do you think that is? What what's the causes? Well, it's important though, just to kind of note though, kind of in the in the northwestern European history, we've had you know variations in, in age of first marriage that run across the last couple of hundred years. In some cases, in England and Ireland, you know, when pe when guys didn't have like access to a decent job or, you know, income or property, um, they would kind of delay their, uh, their age at first marriage and, you know, to the late twenties to some extent. But it is true, like you're saying that we're kind of at an unprecedented level here in the U S um, in our own history. And then if you look across the European um, context, for instance, you do see kind of often record numbers for kind of age at first marriage in countries like, um, you know, Spain or Italy, for instance. So it's, it's certainly no question that we are kind of postponing marriage and foregoing marriage at much higher rates in the modern world today. And that's driven by, I think, a couple of different factors. One point, obviously, is that we are more affluent. You know, we're kind of like the richest society in world history, basically. And so people feel less you know, need to get married and have a family and they feel less dependent upon their families than would have been the case in previous centuries. That's part of the story. We're obviously a more secular society. Um, people are less likely to kind of endow marriage um, and family with some kind of sacred significance. We're more individualistic, um, you know, in line with all that. And then I also would kind of talk about two other things just quickly. One is just the way in which there's a kind of Midas mindset that's kind of captured the hearts and the uh, the minds and the imaginations, I think of a lot of young adults. And the thought there is that what really matters is kind of building your own brand in terms of education, money, especially work. Like the thought is your career is going to be what really matters. And we've seen a lot of polling from Pew, for instance, telling us that young adults today, Brian, are more likely to ascribe like fulfillment. I think fulfillment's going to come from their job, not from, you know, marriage and family. And the final thing that yes. I would mention here is just, our, our young men are flailing. Um, there's a kind of what I call male malaise. It doesn't affect everyone, obviously. They're, they're obviously guys who are flourishing today, teenagers and young men. But a lot of young men, a lot of teenage boys are kind of um, are kind of uh, floundering. You know, they're not really doing well in school. They're not doing well in the workforce in their early 20s. 
um, they just don't have a clear sense of their mission, purpose, and identity. And, and that means they're not attractive when it comes to dating and marrying. So these are some of the factors that I think help to explain why people are postponing marriage. And then they're also foregoing marriage in greater numbers today than was the case in previous decades. Oh, you just gave me another side of the same coin. I hadn't thought about it. I, I, I know very well about, you know, young men and their their difficulties landing and having a vision and going forward. And I was always thinking that's part of the problem with why they're not dating and getting married is because they they're not sure what they want and how marriage fits into that. But you're saying because they don't know what they want and they have a vision, they're not attractive to the opposite sex. Is that what you're saying? Totally. I mean, Fascinating. One, of the, one of the striking things, I mean, I was uprated in the New York Times actually by, you know, a, a left-leaning journalist in the fall. And she said, you know, you're basically scolding women. You know, you're telling them, get married. And that's impossible because we don't have enough good men in our social networks to marriage. This is kind of a progressive response to my um, basic argument. But I'm also hearing the same kind of, of concern articulated, albeit in somewhat different ways, from young women that I know in my community here um, in Charlottesville who are more conservative or more religious. And they're also telling me, look, we just don't have enough men in our circles to date. Uh, we'd like to get married. You know, we, we hope to get married, but we're just worried that there aren't enough men out there who would be, uh, you know, interested in commitment, worthy of commitment and, you know, good husbands uh, down the road. So when men are floundering, um, you know, and I think we're realizing this more and more <laughs> every day, um, but that women are also less likely to flourish too. So that's, that's our, in part, our predicament. And that helps to explain why I think the marriage rates come down in recent years. So are you saying that this is yet another thing to blame men for? We're not having marriages because men aren't getting their shit together. What, what, what are you saying? Yeah, partly you could, you could frame it that way, Brian. But I would also, of course, you know, and in my book, talk about the way in which big tech is implicated in this, the way in mm. which big education is implicated in this, um, the way in which big government is implicated in this, and the way too, the, the culture is implicated in the failure of men to thrive. So when it comes to big tech, I'm obviously thinking about the ways in which things like gaming platforms that are run by our biggest corporations like Microsoft owns, of course, Xbox, are helping to basically undercut um, the capacity of a lot of teenage boys, and young men to thrive. They're just spending too much time on screens and not enough time at school or at work or developing hobbies or getting exercise that would make them better men um, and more marriageable, right? So big tech is part of the problem. Big education is a big part of the problem too. Our schools are not serving our boys well, um, not giving them enough recess, not giving them enough male teachers, not giving them pedagogy, um, substance that really appeals to boys. And yeah, not only that, but not older, no, not older father figures and mentors. Yeah, all that. So, but there's just, there are exceptions, obviously. But I'm just saying, when I, you know, when I look at who's kind of getting all the awards in middle school and high school graduations, it's overwhelmingly yeah. the females. We know yeah. the GPA, top 10% dominated by girls, bottom 10% dominated by boys. Um, so our schools are not setting up our boys for success. And that obviously has real implications for their ability to flourish um, in young adulthood and in the workplace. When it comes to big government, a lot of our unemployment programs are unwittingly, unintentionally, but nevertheless kind of fostering a dependency um, for guys who are relying upon either unemployment or SSDI, so security, disability, you know, to kind of get by and not work full time. So that's part of, you know, that's the story in part. The other thing that I would say is just we don't offer our young men today a clear and compelling model of masculinity in the culture. You hear about toxic masculinity in some precincts. Um, you hear about masculinity from people like Andrew Tate in ways that I think are often, you know, not helpful. But we're not kind of giving our young men like a constructive model of what it means to be a young male, a young man, um, giving them something to aim for. And I think, you know, a lot of guys are more likely to flourish when they have a clear mission and they're not getting that from the culture. So it's no wonder that a lot of young men on both the left and the right are complaining to me about their prospects for dating and marriage because there are a lot of bigger institutional factors and cultural dynamics that are um, undercutting the capacity for young men to grow up and uh, become the men that they could be and should be. 
So before we go down the man rabbit trail, which, which I'm happy to do, I just want to make sure that we're zeroing in on on the key problem. You do believe that the, the key problem in our marriage rates is men. Is that what you're saying? No, I'm saying it's one of the key problems. I mean, there okay. one of the things that I would talk about is, is this kind of minus mindset where both women and men, especially in the more educated, more, um, you know, affluent, tracks, you know, think that the be all and end all of life is the degree on your wall, is the money in your bank account, is is the job, you know, that you're right. aiming for. And so they're not prioritizing marriage. I was talking to a graduate student at UVA not too long ago and asking him about his plans for work. He had a very detailed plan. He was going to, you know, get this degree, he's going to go to this job, he's going to hope to get this point, you know, by age 30. Okay. Then I said, well, what sort of, you know, would you like to get married? Yes. You know, he'd like to get married. What's your plan for, you know, finding a spouse and, you know, um, dating and, and marriage? And there was complete silence, right? So that's also like a, you know, a, a problem is that we don't kind of prioritize and equip our young adults um, to think about how to go about dating and marrying, you know, in the next decade of their life, you know, as they're in college or in high school or in some other kind of young adult space to kind of begin to think about what does it mean to prepare for um, yep. a marital and family future. We're not doing that. So no wonder that we're not, we're not seeing young adults right. move towards marriage. So there are a lot of factors. I talked to you about secularization as well. So, um, but certainly the kind of floundering fortunes of men is one of the dynamics that's at play here. Well, let's back up to even why we should care about this. So I, I think about the world theologically, I think about the standpoint of what does the Bible say? What does my experience with God say? You're, I think you're thinking about it very healthily from a sociological Correct. standpoint. Yeah. So, you know, my I've got theolo- theological reasons as to why marriage is really important. It's not good that a man should be alone. I don't think we function well when we're not in a team. I don't want to go into all that stuff. But from your perspective as a sociological just give us a primer, like, why should we care? Why is this a big deal? You, you, you know, we're getting married later, okay? That, how is that different than we're buying our first car later? How is that different than we're dying later? So what, we're, we're dying later or we're getting married later. What, what, what does this mean for happiness or our country? Why is this an important thing? So I think, um, I don't want to say that everyone should get married at 22, like you that are 24, like I did. I mean, that's clearly not the case. But I think what what is concerning to me is that we are seeing, you know, new demographic projections that suggest to us that one in three young adults today will not get married by at least age 45 and may probably never get married. And so we're projecting kind of record numbers of young adults today, uh, to be clear, a minority, but still record numbers of them not getting married. Um, and the reason that's cause for concern is that Americans who don't get married are more likely to be financially vulnerable, almost half as likely to be, you know, um, not very happy. They're more lonely. They report less meaningful lives. Um, They're much more vulnerable to what we call deaths of despair. Now that's deaths related to suicide, alcohol poisoning, or drug abuse. So, you know, for a lot of women, and I'd say probably especially men, um, without the benefit of a spouse and a family, um, they're more likely to experience great financial and emotional um, and social difficulties in mid and later life. So that's why we should be concerned about this. And because so many young adults today will never marry, the longer you put off kind of looking for a spouse, Right. I think the concern is that you're more likely not to be successful when it comes to finding a spouse. So it's one thing to kind of not be all that serious about finding a spouse in your early 20s. But if you're kind of really not, you know, um, engaging until your late 20s or early 30s, I think in this new demographic and cultural context, you're going to face stiffer odds of finding a good spouse. And so especially like I have a lot of students at UVA who tell me that their parents give them the message College is for education and career preparation. It's not for love. Don't even think about getting married, you know. And I'm like, you just don't understand. This is 2024 is not, you know, 2000 or it's not 1990 when you were in college. We're living in a time and a moment when when young adults are experiencing a lot more difficulty, I think, dating and marrying. And it's, I think, unwise to tell your 20-year-old daughter or son that they should just 
immediately and completely, you know, cross off the possibility when right. they're at college of meeting someone who might end up being, you know, their future spouse. I think that's just not wise. Well, well, it's not even not even that, which I agree entirely. But then, but then we're now told that um, workplace relationships are inappropriate. You can't date somebody at work. Uh, you know, and that was in the past, one third of marriages came from people you meet at work because you're around them. So now now we're saying you can't have high hopes of marriage when you're in college. You got to put your head down and get grades to get the gold. And when you're in the workplace, you can't you can't date anybody because you're going to, you know, you're going to do something inappropriate. and Someone's going to feel uncomfortable and and then there's going to be lawsuits and this and that. So so what's left? Uh, a, a bar? Uh, match.com, you know, which people find people through either one of those things, but they're just, they're just not great places to see somebody the way they are. Right. I mean, correct. So, yeah. So I have uh, a colleague, Dr. Wendy Wang, and she's looked at sort of what is linked to, and we're not, we don't make strong causal claims here as, as social scientists, but she just finds that people who are meeting in college, like in a classroom who are meeting in some kind of church or religious context, who are meeting at a social gathering of friends, um, later are more likely to be happily married. And people who are meeting online and people who are meeting in bars and taverns are less likely to be happily married. So I think there's just kind of ways in which kind of meeting in person and context like this where I'm at at UVA or uh, meeting at a, you know, a, a church, you know, fellowship group or uh, meeting with some, you know, at a, at a party with friends. There are a lot of kind of things happening. You, you can kind of probably get a better sense of what someone's personality is like in a variety of context. Yeah. Yes, You're often right. maybe kind of like, you know, this person is the kind of person who would be good for dating because they're in this kind of friendship network that's, you know, your friendship network. So there's just something about kind of that in-person, you know, opportunity that's better. And so, um, yeah, it is a, it's, it is a problem that we're not having as many of those opportunities now for young adults to kind of uh, meet, mate, and marry in. So let's go back to reasons why we should be concerned about marriage and why it should be happening. You said that you're more financially vulnerable if you're not married. Explain that. Yeah. So what we see basically is that unmarried men and unmarried women um, are more likely to be poor, for instance, even controlling for things like their education, their um, age, their race. Um, so what I mean by that is that women who are not married are about five times more likely to be poor um, compared to women who are married and men who are not married about two times more likely to be poor compared to their peers who are married. Um, and so marriage, um, you know, you, you pull your income typically if you both be working. Mm -hmm. If one person's working, there's a vision of labor. Um, yep. You know, you're saving on things like refrigerators and TVs, obviously, you know, laundry machines, you know, um, when you're married, um, uh, you're more likely to be prudent about your spending and saving. So married people um, save more than equivalent, you know, peers who are cohabiting or single. Yeah. Interesting. Uh, and then when they get to their 50s, huge, huge differences, Brian. So we see in, in my book, for instance, is that um, married men and married women, stably married men, stably married women have about 10 times the assets as their never married peers. Now, obviously, wow. there are what are called selection effects, you know, in our world. The types of people who are getting married, staying married are somewhat different, you know. Hmm, but interesting. Um, but it's still a case that just marriage as an institution, I would argue, um, is more favorable to building up a strong financial foundation. And one example of that, too, just to mention as well, is that people who are not stably married are more likely to be experiencing things like, you know, for men, especially becoming a non-resident father, for women becoming a single parent, and these things are really expensive, you know, for obvious reasons. Um, mm -hmm. If you have family instability, they're often like attorneys become involved with your life. Mm -hmm. You have to go to court, you know, um, you may have to move out of your house, you know, or your apartment because there is, you know, drama in the background. So the point is that family instability and family drama are very expensive as well. So people who kind of can like steer clear of all that by getting and staying married just do a lot better financially than their fellow Americans who um, are not able to do that today. Last week I was working out and I felt a little tinge in my elbow. And I was like, yeah, that's fine. Let's, let, let's power through it. Sure. So I, I kept doing one-arm curls with 100 pounds. And uh, as I was doing <laughs> 
<laughs> That's a joke. That's a joke, doctor. I cannot do one arm curls 100 pounds. But I was I was doing dirt gets it over there. Dirt gets my humor. I got you. I got you. <laughs> I uh I should not have kept going because I really jacked up my elbow. Like really like uh, just <laughs> hyper pain. So I had to put ice pa- ice on it and for it to stay on it I'm wrapping it with a um ace bandage sure. and it's very 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 difficult to balance an ice pack on your elbow while with your teeth and one hand you try to wrap wrap it around so of course my wife my wife is there she's helping me my or my assistant as well when I'm when I'm here and I just thought gosh if I wasn't married like I'm on my own all the time like it was even something as simple as putting an ice pack on, mm-hmm. but I'm gonna go. I'm gonna go over to the neighbor's house. Yes, I could do that. That's probably yeah. good and healthy. But I'm just saying, there's so many built-in potency with team that I don't think people see the hyper blessing with with marriage. I think that we just only have advertised yeah. to us all the pain and difficulty and trauma for some people that comes with it. Right. So, you know, Andrew Tate obviously is discouraging young men from putting rings. So there's no return on investment for marriage. He is? Yeah, for young he men. He is? All right. But, so but, I've seen a picture of this guy. I've heard people talk about this guy. Yeah. Uh, this, he, wait, he's actually teaching young men do not get married. Yeah, 100%. It's huge. What a loser. I was, I mean, Freaking whether loser. I go, I was oh in gosh. Utah um, and I was speaking to a Mormon audience. I was here in Charlottesville speaking to uh, an evangelical audience and high school audiences, both cases, and high school boys in both of those communities here in Virginia and, and in Utah were asking about Andrew Tate and his critique of marriage. And so what Tate basically is saying to guys, you know, don't invest in marriage. It's a losing proposition. There's no return on, you know, on the institution today. But what he doesn't recognize, doesn't appreciate is that today, most marriages go the distance. And as you reach, I think, middle life and later life, especially having the benefit of a spouse, you know, and I would say kin more generally is just huge. I saw this, you know, my own life with my father-in-law who had, you know, was at the UVA hospital for some major surgery and it didn't go well initially. And my mother-in-law was just like on those doctors and nurses, you know, like, I mean, like you wouldn't believe and, you know, I, I don't know, like, how much of her advocacy for my father-in-law was part of the, you know, the ultimate success. But he got through a very difficult set of surgeries, um, and he's doing great now. But you could see how having the benefit of a spouse in his corner, kind of going to bat with doctors and nurses repeatedly over about, a, you know, a, a month and a half, I think was probably part and parcel of why he came out of all that surgery, you know, in his late 70s successfully. Well, it's not just having a partner to help you with tactile things and emotional things. Sure. But it's also, there's a kind of growing up that only happens when you get married. There's a kind of selflessness that you only develop once you get married. That then when you once you develop it, it enables you to have better friendships, to be a better employee, to be a better boss, to manage people better, because you understand people better, you care for people more, and that actually has an impact on you emotionally, relationally, financially, spiritually, all those things. But the learning lab for personal, spiritual, personal formation, there's not marriage. There, there's nothing like it. Yeah, and that's right. I think that you know, marriage and and parenthood um, are both opportunities to grow in virtue. And in doing so, they give us a tremendous sense of meaning and purpose. Um, and then if we're left to our own devices, we often kind of, you know, if we don't have a spouse and we don't have kids, and this is obviously not true for everybody, but I think for a, you know, for a decent subset of people, they can kind of get lost in any number of distractions, dopamine hits, you know, other, other patterns of behavior that can lead them down a negative road. And that's, and that's why we do see the deaths of despair, for instance, Brian, again, are much more common among women and and especially men who don't have college degrees and are not married. You know, they don't have a spouse. Um, they don't have the kind of the, the routine, daily routine, the sense that they're living with and for someone else. And that can put them into a, a negative trajectory um, more uh, easily than folks who have a spouse and are caring for a family. You mentioned earlier that we've become more individualistic and in- 
you tied it, if I'm not mistaken, you tied it to the fact that we're becoming more secular. You know, we, we're, we're continually becoming more like Europe. Church attendance, not important. Belief in God, not important or not practiced. More individualistic. What's, what's the tie, in your opinion, between more secular or less belief in, belief in God and more individualistic? How, how are those two links? Yeah, so what, what we see, obviously, in many religious traditions is there is a focus on what I call familism, which is the sort of opposite of individualism. And it's kind of this idea that um, life in part is about living for your spouse, your children, your parents, your kin, um, that you have obligations to support and serve your parents and your children and your spouse. There are kind of norms governing God in your life. Um and individualism is more likely to sort of tell you, like, look, just do whatever you feel like, whatever you desire, whatever you want. You know, that's what's important, not what's sort of, you know, needful for your family. And so in different ways, religious traditions have, you know, um, often pushed people in a more familistic direction. And that's why you would see in many traditions like Christianity and Islam and Judaism, for instance, that marriage and fertility, for instance, are markedly higher among uh, Muslims and Christians and Jews who are, um, you know, practicing their faith in one way or another. So that's the kind of, and so when, when, the, when society becomes more secular, um, it's also becoming more individualistic. And then also too, I think when people are becoming more individualistic, they're less likely to ascribe importance to, you know, the religious traditions and teachings that they might've experienced as, as young children. So aside from people get married less when you're in a more secular culture, though you're also saying that this, when you're more secular culture, you're also more lonely. Just aside from marriage, you're just making fewer, fewer human connections with people. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, I am saying that. And makes there's, sense. there's even an article in the Atlantic today making that same point from a, you know, a, a relatively agnostic uh, writer um, just talking about how the decline of religion in America is, one of the big factors driving a kind of a sense of lost community in this country as well. Um, we saw, for instance, during COVID time that, you know, happiness plummeted for most Americans, Brian, uh, you know, in 2020. The, the, the big exception there, when you look at Gallup data, was Americans who were um, worshiping in person, you know, um, in 2020. So the folks who managed, you know, to figure out after those first few months, right after, you know, March, when things shut down in 2020, if they were kind of worshiping in person by summertime in 2020, um, they were much more likely to kind of, you know, stay at a relatively high level when it comes to their happiness and well-being, according to uh, according to Gallup data. And it's just one example of, of this point. Yeah, the, the belief in God has got so many reverberating positive effects. That I don't think get trumpeted enough. I just saw a thing by Christopher Hitchens, who, you know, the well known atheist who's done all that he can to have people not believe in God. He's come out recently and he's declared himself a cultural Christian. He said, I'm not a Christian, but I'm a cultural Christian. And and his reasoning for that is he likes the culture that Christianity creates. Anything that's healthy for society. And when, it's fascinating. When you spent your whole life telling people, don't believe in God, don't believe in Christ, it's not real, but everybody who believes in that happens to have created a culture that I want to exist in. It just seems a bit confusing to me. Yeah, I mean, I think there are, you know, figures and voices today um, who are recognizing that the retreat from faith um, in their cultural context, their countries, um, you know, like the example you just gave us, is not kind of leading to the result that they expected. Um, whether it's because, you know, whether they think that, you know, one tradition's not, uh, one new tradition's not good, or because they think a kind of hyper progressive, you know, replacement to faith is problematic um, as well. So, yeah, there's just no question that a lot of people who kind of were very critical of the role of Christian faith in their societies, um, you know, a few decades ago are, are kind of having second thoughts, second thoughts today about that. What can, what can the government or 
public policies do to kind of incentivize people to take a new look at, at marriage? If it's if they're not going to look at marriage because folks like you or I are saying, hey, it's a good idea, good idea. Are there any, you know, healthy carrots and sticks that we can that we can use to help people see this stuff? Well, in terms of like, I think carrots, I mean, obviously I'm, the work of my book is to kind of give people a sense that like there's nothing that predicts happiness better for ordinary Americans than a good marriage. Not, wow. not money, not education, wow. um, not a good career, contrary to what a lot of people think today, not regular sex, not even regular church going, right? So the number one factor that I see in the general social survey that predicts happiness is a good marriage. Um, that's so right. that's, that's, I think, worth kind of uh, underlining for people who are kind of more inclined to the Midas mindset. Um, but I think it's also about stories too. And it's about stories that we tell in our homes that we live out in our families that you, you know, if, you know, if you're talking about in your church, um, and kind of underlining like the sort of before and after. Um, so you might, you know, I talk about a young woman in my, in my book who kind of, she, yeah, she enjoyed her free time. She enjoyed shopping. She enjoyed, you know, following her fam- favorite female bloggers in her twenties when she was single and unmarried. Um, so she talks a lot about a lot of things that were enjoyable about being single and unmarried in her twenties. Now that she's a married mother, life is harder. You know, she's got crying toddlers. She's got, you know, kids are up late at night. Sometimes, you know, there's more chaos in her home. All, you know, you can sort of fill in the blanks there, but she says kind of in spite of all of that, you know, in spite of the fact that being a mom can be really challenging at times, there's no question that my life is more fulfilling, that I'm growing opportunities to, you know, be more sacrificial, live for others, and I'm happier in a more profound way. So kind of telling her story, if you will, which I do in my book, and the stories of women and men like her, you know, from the pulpit or in some other context in a, in a church, you know, arena is help, I think helps people understand um, what's, you know, what's at stake here. And then obviously thinking about ways to kind of do that in social media and in um, our schools and in movies and music and other, you know, cultural venues that help to sort of shape the way in which teenagers and young adults think about um, their world and their immediate future. Yeah, the the old storyline that I had in movies when I grew up it was always boy gets girl, married happily ever after. That was like how the ending was for all of them. What's the last movie ever seen where married and happily ever after? It's that's not that's not a goal that's ever modeled for us in our art anymore. Well, but I think it's awesome in the challenge you raise everyone, you know, everyone comes from some kind of family, right, Brian? So yep. and we all know that in every family there there is, you know, there's trauma, there's hurt, there's disappointment, there's anger in one way or another. And so I think part of the challenge here too is I'm not I'm not asking people to paint like some kind of rose colored portrait of like you're gonna get married and everything's gonna be just completely wonderful for you. Um, if you read my book, I talk about, you know, when we we adopted five kids and then we had twins unexpectedly in about a two and a half year period. So we went from three kids in 2007 to seven kids at the end of 2009. And I was, I mean, ironically- <laughs> I'm sorry, let me just laugh for a moment. Oh gosh, yeah. wow. Okay, all right, keep going. So, you know, ironically, you know, and I, and I say this in all humility, like I was the one in 2009 and my wife had just given birth to twins who was like, I was totally stressed out as a dad, you know, both in terms of like all these kids in the household. And then also, um, you know, it was the recession 2009, you know, it was hitting and I was worried about f- the financial implications of all these children, you know, et cetera. So the point is that I was not happily married at that point. I was not happy with life in general at that point. I'm not kind of trying to paint some, you know, treacly portrait of everything's going to be perfect once you get married and have kids. But now, you know, we had twins in 2009 and now almost every night, Brian, one of those twins will find me wherever I am in my home. And she'll give me either a kiss on the forehead or a hug. Uh, and that's just like, you just can't, I mean, uh, what, I'm, you know, 53 years old. I'm like, that's just like an incredible thing to have. Right. And so this is what people have to understand and appreciate is that yes, marriage can be extraordinarily tough. Yes. Being a parent um, can be super hard, but at the end of the day, you know, the, the sense of meaning and purpose and general joy you get from being married and having kids um, you know, if you make decent effort to be a good spouse and a good father or a good mother, 
I think, you know, the, the ROI on that is just incalculable. Right. Taking care of your health isn't always easy, but it should be at least simple. That's why for the last two years, I've been drinking AG1 every day, no exceptions, at home, on a hunting trip, camping off my motorcycle, no exceptions. It's just one scoop mixed in water once a day, every day, and it makes me feel ready to get moving. That's because each serving of AG1 delivers my daily dose of vitamins, minerals, pre and probiotics, and more. It's a powerful, healthy habit that's also powerfully simple. I like to have it in the morning. I have a 12 ounce of water, so right off the bat, I'm, I'm helping my hydration every single morning. This is the one product, if I had to recommend one, I'd recommend this one to elevate your health. It's AG1, and that's why I partnered with them for two years. So if you want to take ownership of your health, start with AG1. Try AG1 and get a free one-year supply of vitamin D3 plus K2 and five free AG1 travel packs with your first purchase. Go to drinkag1.com slash aggressive life. That's drink ag one dot com slash aggressive life. Get yourself some. I'm, I'm curious if you are up on AI and what's happening with dating and male satisfaction through AI. Are you up on up on the latest on this? Um, well, I'm kind of up on sort of dating apps more generally and just sort of the... Um, no, no, this is way, way more sinister so, than that. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, so I have seen some, like there's, there was a New York times, for instance, video about AI in China and it was profiling two young adults, I think, or three young adults, um, who were not as, who were a little bit, you know, maybe I think uh, awkward or socially, you know, um, not as gifted. And they were kind of gravitating towards AI companions in, in this video of these Chinese young adults. And so I think the concern that I would have, and probably it sounds like you have as well, is that as AI becomes more advanced and provides, you know, chats with people and images to people, um, and then becomes probably, you can probably imagine robots down the road, obviously doing this as well. There's going to be a, a share of Americans um, and people across the globe who are going to be gravitating towards AI um, for in intimacy. Right of, you know, different stripes. And, um, I think that's, that's going to yep. make them enormously sad over time. And, and, um, yeah, so it's certainly going to be a, going to be yep. a problem down the road. That's a hundred percent what I'm talking about to be more specific for our listeners. In case you're not aware of this, cause everyone talks AI, 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 it seems like the, the ultimate answer to everything that's scary about the future or high productivity, AI, AI. So I, I have a buddy of mine who is just spending time with Google. There's 20 AI companies that Google's in, been bringing together in a round table. My buddy owns one of those companies and is going down a different path. And that's why Google's kind of really fascinated with them as they talk these things. He was filming me on actually just this morning. So you can, you pay a monthly fee for a woman that looks attractive to you and you can't tell that she's not a human being when she, when you zoom her and she has all of your texts, all of your emails, all your, so she knows you. Mm -hmm. sure. And so as you talk to her, she can respond in an empathetic way and a wise way and give, you know, to do, do sex pics and all that stuff. And, and you have a, you have regular meetups, you said, and it's paid and you know exactly what you're doing and you're getting carried away with someone. This is like the, the Notre Dame linebacker was a 10 years ago who had that uh, scandal because he got duped by somebody that he thought he had a, it was his girlfriend, but it sure. wasn't at all. Right. Um, right. People are signing up for that right now and they're finding it. And when I say people, I'm not saying there's a, some few odd people. I'm saying large, large numbers are opting for this over the complexity of talking to a real woman. It's the reason why Emma Schmidt, who's been one of our uh, sex therapists who's come in with us a couple, a uh, few times, her highest clientele is males in their 20s who, when they get out on a date, they can't perform because all they know is their own hand several times a week for many, many, many years. And they just freeze 
because they don't know how to talk and touch an actual real person. Um, this is what we're doing to our young males. This isn't weird fear in the future. This is here right now. And I think it's one of the reasons why guys aren't, we, we have a placebo to actually not get to know a real woman. I think it's going to get worse. What do you think? Right. No, I do think, and this is, I mean, it, it applies to, you know, sex and it applies to things just more generally. I think if people are spending so much time on, you know, these uh, devices, then they're losing touch with what it means to be human in some kind of authentic and powerful and profound ways. And um, so I think the fact that our smartphones are getting better, that our gaming devices are getting more um, attractive, pornography is going to get, you know, more um, appealing as well with the technology and, you know, and these immersive technologies as well. It's, it's going to be more and more of what I call electronic opiates, um, yeah. where there's a short term dopamine hit, but a long term um, price you pay for not developing the social skills and relationships that are most important when it comes to building and forging a meaningful life today. So we've, we're talking a bit about what do we do to encourage people to get married? I, I love that's the title of your book. It's a pretty simple, get married, just get married. I love that. But let's have, um, do a little encouragement, a little pick me ups for those of us who are married, but it's gotten a little stale. Uh, why, why, right. why should we look at our marriages as an asset? What should we do to, to keep things fresh? Uh, just, just give us a little bit of rah rah. Those of us who are in the locker room and maybe a little bit worn down from marriage. So I think there, are, there are kind of five um, C's that I stress in the book, and those C's are communion, children, commitment, cash, and community as sort of like the five pillars of a, of a strong. Hmm and stable marriage. On the community side, I talk about kind of really two things. One is just the importance of fostering a we before me mindset. Um, a lot of Americans are tempted to kind of do a me first thing in their marriage. So one example, this is about money. So we're hearing from a lot of figures, the guy on Shark Tank um, was making this argument recently. Um, also, we see the same piece coming from you know, other financial gurus out there kind of telling you, just keep your own accounts. Oh. Um, you know, and we know actually from my book and other work that um, even experimental evidence, the people who have joint accounts are more likely to be flourishing in a marriage is less likely to end in, div end in divorce court. Mm -hmm. On the community piece too, just kind of recognizing that it's, you've got to make an effort, especially us guys, to keep your marriage um, romantically alive. And one way to do that is just to have regular date nights where you kind of get away from the kids, get away from whatever stresses and challenges you have and just spend time together. Um Ideally, doing things that are somewhat novel, um, just to kind of keep uh, things uh, romantically alive in your marriage. So that's one thing. Communion, children, just recognizing that your marriage exists for you know for many of us. If you have kids, in part for the welfare of your children, and you're going to kind of try to keep your marriage strong, and you're going to try to avoid divorce court um, by you know um, you know working on your marriage recognizing that your kids are going to be better for it. That's the, the second C. Third C is about commitment, uh, recognizing commitment is the foundation for a strong marriage, good marriage, happy marriage. And I talk about it in very concrete ways in terms of the D word and fidelity. In terms of the D word, you just don't let your mind go to divorce. You don't talk about divorce. Um, you recognize that most couples have difficult chapters, have disappointments, frustrations. Um, no one's perfect. And so you, you kind of try to work through your problems rather than uh, looking to divorce as a, as a way out. Now, of course, there are exceptions, things like, you know, domestic violence would be an obvious exception. But in general, I think you kind of can keep the D word out of um, both your conversation and your thinking. You're more likely to flourish in marriage. On the fidelity piece, just recognizing that both kind of in-person situations and even maybe some ways more online situations can get you into trouble. And so, like, you know, don't follow an old flame on Facebook or Insta, you know, uh. don't kind of allow, you know, conversations in person or online to go in directions that um, you couldn't talk easily with about your, you know, with your spouse about them, you know, exercise some prudence, you know, don't go out drinking with people who aren't, you know. Like if you're on like on a trip for work, you know, if you're going to Hawaii with, you know, a bunch of people from the office probably not a great idea to go out bar hopping, you know, in Honolulu with, with your buddies that, that may not end well. Right. So just kind of exercising some prudence there, um, on, on terms of trying to maintain fidelity, recognizing that you have to, 
um, focus on your spouse. And that means kind of having some, you know, some uh, prudent walls between you and, and potential attractive alternatives, both in person and on this, a cash point, just recognize that stable income and shared assets build strong marriages. And it's particularly the case that when men are employed full time, people tend to be happier, more stably married. There was a study from Harvard that showed that when the wife lost her job, no effect on divorce, Brian. When the husband lost his job, 33% increase in divorce. Hmm. And I think that's just because when men are not stably employed, they're more likely to be floundering and wives still in 2024 tend to be in charge of, you know, the majority of um, household, you know, tasks and challenges. And so if the husband's not kind of a reliable um, provider, breadwinner, um, you know, that's that's going to be a cause for um, concern oftentimes. Didn't find a big difference for marriages on whether or not the wife worked inside or outside the home. But again, like when the husband was not stably employed, that was a, a red flag. And the final C is community. And the idea there is that we are our friends. Hmm. And so you need to kind of do a, a sort of look around like, who are my friends? Are they a good influence on my marriage and family? You know, are, am I inspired by my guy friends, if I'm a husband and father, to raise the bar for my own commitments to my family you know do the guys that i know you know do they I, where it might be in there do they go camping with their kids do you know do they play basketball with their kids you know do they um teach their kids how to play the piano do they you know um challenge their kids with history if you're religious you know theology lessons whatever but just to kind of be aware of like basically if your friends are kind of trying to be good husbands and good fathers good wives and good mothers or if they're single kind of living you know virtuous lives volunteering you know plugged into their communities in meaningful important valuable ways then your odds of flourishing in marriage are quite high but if your friends are disloyal unfaithful if they say critical things about their their boyfriends, girlfriends, husbands, wives, if, yeah. you know, they're, they're just kind of not doing good stuff, if they're drinking too much, using drugs, you know, whatever else it might be, you can fill in the blank, then your odds of floundering or getting in trouble in your marriage are much higher. And this comes through, obviously, in the story of Governor Mark Sanford from South Carolina, Republican governor, obviously, a number of years ago. And he probably had some pattern of going with his buddies, guy buddies, maybe from college or something else, on a big international trip every year. And I think they kind of would, would cut loose when they were on these trips together, just the guys. And so one year, obviously, he was in uh, South America, big party, dancing, you know, whatever else. He met some woman down there, they hit it off, and then he got into a relationship with her. And, and that relationship, you know, both ended his marriage and at the time ended his role as the governor of South Carolina. It's just an example of how you've got to pick your friends wisely. And, you know, if they're leading you down a, a bad path, you know, you got to bail. Oh, it's interesting. I didn't know that was the, the backstory behind that guy who had high hopes for his political career. I don't, I don't exactly. know that. Yeah. Okay. So uh, let, let's go, let's speak to both, both categories of people here as we come to the end here. Let's speak to marry people and let's speak to, those who are not married. Let's stay in the married for a moment. Of all the things just mentioned, um, Brad, of all the th you know, all the guys you've hung out with, had a coffee with, had a beer with, guy or woman starts telling you about thing with marriage here and there. Is is there any low hanging fruit, like easiest, like pop? If you're married, just pop. Do this. Just if you're married, just pop. Stop doing this. If you're married, like what's the What's the thing for those who are married? We can actually, you're probably sure nine out of 10 of us aren't doing this and could do it. Well, I think one thing that's a challenge for all of us um, is just, um, you know, putting these devices in the the corner of the kitchen on the charger. He's holding up his iPhone. And yeah. he is a true man who has an iPhone instead of a Google Android. Very good. And good just man, plugging yes. it in and letting it sit there, you know, the more the merrier, right? And so, you know, I think ideally for most of us, we just, we, we, come, we come home, we put the iPhone on the charger and it stays there. Um, ideally, <laughs> the whole time, obviously that's not realistic. But so, I, and, and we kind of focus on sort of eye to eye conversations with our, our wife and kids. You know, that's, I think, part and parcel of, uh, solving a lot of, of our problems today. Um, I think recognizing that work is less important than family. Yeah. Um, I think recognizing too, for a lot of guys today that your hobbies are not as important as your family. 
Um, these are the kinds of things that are helpful. Um, and that sacrificial living, both for your spouse and your kids. And if you are, um, you know, religious for your religious community are going to have a real ROI, you know, so, um, volunteering for things at your church that you're not necessarily inclined to do or at your kid's school. Um, and then as you kind of make your way around the home, you know, doing that thing that, needs to get done and you're just tempted to ignore um, and either let your in men's case, let your wife do it or, or just let it go undone. So these are the kinds of things that I think are helpful um, for contemporary couples. Good. And for those of us who are not married, uh, something that improves the likelihood that we're moving towards marriage. What's the lowest hanging fruit, something we can do. So I think, um, telling your friends you would like to get married and having them kind of set you up is always a good thing. Um, mm -hmm. I've seen that in my community, um, here in, in Charlottesville, Virginia, and also kind of just volunteering. And if you, again, if you are religious plugging into your local congregation, you know, just, you know, doing a good number of things in your local church, um, volunteering, getting out there, meeting people, and then having, you know, the courage to either ask them on a date or, or to, uh, to say yes to a date and giving someone a chance, you know, so those are some concrete pieces of advice um, for Good. people who aren't married. Brad, is there anything you want to talk about that we haven't talked about? Anything you wish I would have asked you that I haven't asked you? Like anything on the National Marriage Project or anything at all? I just want to make sure that we're hitting the stuff you think we should be hitting. And this is great. Just you can follow me on Twitter, Brad Wilcox, IFS, or uh, the website familystudies.org has a lot of great resources on marriage and parenting and family life. So, Brian, thank you. Well, you're welcome. Give, give us that, that website again. It's familystudies.org. And then my Twitter is Brad Wilcox IFS on, on Twitter. And his latest book is called Get Married. All right. Hey, look, this is called The Aggressive Life. It's not The Interesting Thoughts Life. We actually expect you to do something different. That's what's called being aggressive. We actually expect that this is on, oh, interesting thoughts. Who the latest interesting thoughts for the day. We expect when we hear something that's worthwhile, we're going to actually do it. We're going to aggressively go after it. So if you're not married, why don't you ask somebody out? Why don't, if you're not married, why don't you put yourself in a position where you actually might meet somebody and might talk to somebody? If you are married, maybe you want to try the put the phone, plug it in when you get home and just don't use it the rest of the night. I probably could use that counsel myself. It's always kind of right there by me to get a little fix when someone texts me. I feel like I'm important or I'm needed or something like that. No, Lib needs me. My family needs me. I don't need to be on that thing all the time. I don't know what it is, guys and ladies, but I'm telling you this, what we're doing doesn't work. The studies are very, very clear. The shark eyes on the average person's face shows that we are isolated, we are drifting, we are not flourishing. It's not working, this individualistic idea of I can do it myself, it doesn't work. So hey, take control of your life, go the opposite direction, don't do what everyone else is doing because it's not the right thing, and go build yourself a great life. We'll see you next time on The Aggressive Life. Thanks for joining us on this journey toward aggressive living. Find more resources, articles, past episodes, and live events over at bryantome.com. My new books, a repackaged edition of The Five Marks of a Man and a brand new Five Marks of a Man tactical guide are open right now on Amazon. If you haven't yet, leave this podcast a rating and review. It really helps get the show in front of new listeners. And if you want to connect, find me on Instagram at Brian Tome. The Aggressive Life is a production of Crossroads Church, Cincinnati, Ohio.